Good morning, white readers. It is our last week of Erla lessons. We have two lessons and we're going to continue with our Cinderella theme. Today you're going to be listening to two stories. That's right, I said listening. For the past couple of weeks, you've been reading the Cinderella stories, and the last two that we're going to be listening to um, are stories that are in print, but we don't have those available to us. So we're going to be listening to them on YouTube and hearing the stories. I picked these last two because they are stories that are, they are considered Cinderella stories, but they're not they don't have all of the elements that the rest of the Cinderella stories have had. And we'll talk about that a little bit further as we get into the lesson. So let me go ahead and start the presentation and get into exactly what I mean by that. Okay, so here is our lesson 22, and this is a two day lesson. So you're gonna have this lesson for today and tomorrow. All right, our supplies and materials. Here are the two stories that I'm talking about. You're going to need your student notebook and a pencil. And there's going to be two, two stories attached to this presentation that you can find on YouTube. Now, the first story is called The Rough Face Girl. And it is a story about a Native American girl. And she gets the nickname The Rough Face Girl because of her circumstances. And that means the life that she's living. And then our second story is Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters. And this is an African American tale. Both are wonderful stories, and I think that you're really going to enjoy them both. So if you look at our learning goals, we're going to compare and contrast the story elements of both of these stories, just like you did when you read If the Shoe Fits. But this is going to be different because you're going to use your listening skills to gather important information from the story. So you're really going to be listening carefully for those Cinderella elements. Well, what are we talking about when we say the Cinderella elements? Well, this is what we're talking about right here. So, so far as we've been reading, we've been reading Cinderella stories and almost all versions of Cinderella stories have these common elements. There's a heroine, which, which remember we said a female hero who is kind yet very mistreated. So a very, very kind heart. A father who has passed away or who is away. A stepmother and stepsisters who are cruel. A magical element to save the Cinderella character. An element that identifies Cinderella, such as a slipper, a shoe, or a boot, and some type of prince or princess or wealthy person, remember that's rich, who falls in love with the Cinderella character. Well, here's where we're going to be different this week prior than the weeks that we've been, been in before. In both of these stories, there's a father who is present, a father who is very special to both of the girls in these stories. There is no stepmother. There is no mother around. Here is another different element. There will be sisters who are cruel, not stepsisters and not a stepmother, but sisters who are cruel. And another element that's going to be different, the last one, is that there is not an element of a shoe, such as a, a shoe, a slipper, or a boot that identifies the Cinderella character. But yet, these are still considered versions of the Cinderella story. One, a Native American tale right on the banks of Lake Ontario, which is the area that you grew up in. Rochester, New York is on the banks of Lake Ontario. So this story is about, is a Native American tale from our exact area. So we're gonna be looking at then, takes it down to just um, four elements that we're gonna be looking at as we listen to both of these stories. So again, our first story is going to be the rough-faced girl. So again, there's going to be a, her a heroine who is kind yet mistreated. There are going to be sisters who are cruel. There's going to be a magical element to save the Cinderella character and some type of prince or princess or wealthy person who falls in love with the Cinderella character. So when you're listening to the story, I want you to focus on those four things. So right now, you probably want to pause the video and take out your notebook and write down these four things that you're going to be listening for. So as you hear those four things, you can write down the notes in your notebook. 
And remember, boys and girls, because you're listening to this story and it's going to be playing for you on YouTube, you can pause the presentation at any time. You can go back and listen to a part you thought you missed, and it's going to be in this presentation so you can play it as many times as you need to. So if you pause right now and write down these four things, it's going to be the same four things when you listen to Mafaro's Beautiful Daughters. But what we're going to do is we're going to read The Rough-Faced Girl today and Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters tomorrow. So this Venn diagram is the same Venn diagram that you have used last week when you listened to the stories from If the Shoe Fits. So you're going to compare and contrast the rough-faced girl with the traditional Cinderella story that you're used to. And remember, the traditional Cinderella story is the one that Disney made that we were used to seeing with the Cinderella and the mice and the fairy good godmother and the ball and the glass slipper and all that wonderful stuff. Okay, so again, your um, it's going to be important that you keep out your notebook and you listen to the rough faced girl as we go through the story so that you can write down what you're hearing and, and know how to answer these questions. So we're going to come back here and this is where you're going to want to pause to listen to the story for tomorrow. But what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be backing it up back to this screen right here so that I can play you the story of the rough-faced girl. And again, remember, you're focusing on these four questions only. We're gonna enjoy this story. You pay in time. You pay in grit. You pay in dedication. So. Once, long ago, there was a village by the shores of Lake Ontario. Off from the other wigwams in this village stood one great huge wigwam. Painted on its sides were pictures of the sun, moon, stars, plants, trees, and animals. And inside this wigwam there was said to live a very great, rich, powerful, and supposedly handsome, invisible being. However, no one could see him except his sister who lived there too. Many women wanted to marry this invisible being, but his sister said, only the one who can see him can marry him. Now, in this village, there lived a poor man who had three daughters. The two older daughters were cruel and hard-hearted, and they made their youngest sister sit by the fire and feed the flames. When the burning branches popped, the sparks fell on her. In time, her hands became burned and scarred. Her arms, too, became rough and scarred. Even her face was marked by the fire, and her beautiful, long black hair hung ragged and charred. And those two older sisters laughed at her, saying, Ha! You're ugly, you rough-faced girl! And they made her life very lonely and miserable indeed. One day, these two older sisters went to their father and said, Father, give us some necklaces. Give us some new buckskin dresses. Give us some pretty beaded moccasins. We're going to marry the invisible being. So their father gave them these things. Dressed in their finest, the two girls marched through the village. All the people pointed and stared. Look at those beautiful girls, they said. Surely they shall marry the invisible being. And if those two girls were proud and hard-hearted before, they were even prouder now. They walked haughtily through the village. At last they came to the wigwam of the invisible being. And there was his sister, waiting. Why have you come? she asked. We want to marry the invisible being, they answered. That's why we're here. If you want to marry my brother, she replied, you have to have seen him. Tell me. Have you seen the invisible being? Of course we've seen him, they insisted. Can't you see how pretty we are? Can't you see the beautiful clothes we wear? Oh yes, anyone can tell that we've truly seen the invisible being. All right, she said quietly. 
If you think you've seen him, then tell me, what's his bow made of? And suddenly her voice was swift as lightning and strong as thunder. His, his bow? They stammered in surprise. Turning desperately to one another, they whispered, what shall we say? Let's say it's the oak tree. No, said the sister of the invisible being. Oh, she saw at once how they lied. Tell me, she continued, if you think you've seen my brother, the invisible being, then what's the runner of his sled made of? Uh, we know, we know, cried those two sisters. But whispering feverishly again, they wondered, what shall we say? Let's say it's the green willow branch. No, said the sister when she heard. No, you have not seen my brother. Now go home. Just test us fairly, they exclaimed. We've seen him. Just don't ask us all these silly questions. All right, said the sister of the invisible being. Come with me. And she took them back to the great wigwam and sat them in the seats furthest from the entrance, the guest seats. Soon they heard footsteps coming along the path. Then something stepped inside. Though they heard breathing, the two sisters still couldn't see a thing. Suddenly, a great bow and a beaded quiver of arrows appeared in the air and were set down. But though those two girls sat there, their eyes wide all through the night, they never saw a thing more. And in the morning, they had to go home, ashamed. abcmouse.com is so fun. There's a ton. The next day, the rough-faced girl went to her father and said, Father, may I please have some beads? May I please have a new buckskin dress and some pretty moccasins? I am going to marry the invisible being, for wherever I look, I see his face. But her father sighed. Daughter, he said, I'm sorry. I have no beads left for you, only some little broken shells. I have no buckskin dress, and as for moccasins, all I have left are my own old, worn, cracked, and stretched out pair from last year and they're much too big. But she said, whatever you can spare, I can use. So he gave her these things. Then she found dried reeds, and taking the little broken shell, she strung a necklace. She stripped birch bark from the dead trees and made a cap, a dress, and leggings. Then, with a sharp piece of bone, she carved in the bark pictures of the sun, moon, stars, plants, trees, and animals. She soaked the moccasins in the water until they grew soft, but they were still too big, and they flapped, flapped, flapped like duck's feet as she walked. Then all of the people came out of their wigwams. They pointed and stared. Look at that ugly girl, they laughed. Look at her strange clothes. Go home, you ugly girl. You'll never marry the invisible being. But the rough faced girl faith in herself, and she had courage. She didn't turn back. She just kept walking right through the village. As she walked on, she saw the great beauty of the earth and skies spreading before her. And truly she alone, of all in that village, saw in these things the sweet yet awesome face of the invisible being. At last, she came to the lake shore just as the sun was sinking behind the hills and the many stars came glittering out like a fiery veil in the darkening sky overhead. And there, standing by the water's edge, was the sister of the invisible being, waiting. Now, the sister of the invisible being was a wise woman. When she looked at you, she didn't see just your face or your hair or clothes, no. When she looked at you, she would look you right in the eyes and she could see all the way down to your heart. And she could tell if you had a good, kind heart or a cold, hard, and cruel one. And when she looked at the rough-faced girl, she saw at once that, though her skin was scarred, 
her hair burnt and her clothes strange, she had a beautiful, kind heart. And so she welcomed her dearly, saying, Ah, oh, my sister, why have you come? And the rough-faced girl replied, I have come to marry the invisible being. Ah, oh, said the sister very gently now, if you want to marry him, you have to have seen him. If you have seen him, tell me, what's his bow made of? And the rough-faced girl said, his bow? Why, it is the great curve of the rainbow. Ah, exclaimed the sister in excitement. Tell me, she asked, if you have seen my brother, the invisible being, what's the runner of his sled made of? And the rough-faced girl, looking up into the night sky, said, the runner of his sled? Why, it's the spirit road, the Milky Way of stars that spreads across the sky. Ah, cried the sister in wonder and delight. You have seen him. Come with me. And taking the rough-faced girl by the hand, she led her back to the great wigwam and sat her in the seat next to the entrance, the wife's seat. Then they heard footsteps coming along the path, closer and closer. The entrance flap of the wigwam lifted up and in stepped the invisible being. And when he saw her sitting there, he said, at last we have been found out. Then, smiling kindly, he added, and oh, my sister, but she is beautiful. And his sister said, yes. The sister of the invisible being then gave the rough-faced girl the finest of buckskin robes and a necklace of perfect shells. Now bathe in the lake, she said, and dress in these. So the rough-faced girl bathed in the waters of the lake. Suddenly, all the scars vanished from her body. Her skin grew smooth again, and her beautiful black hair grew in long and glossy as a raven's wing. Now, anyone could see that she was indeed beautiful. But the invisible being and his sister had seen that from the start. Then, at last, the rough-faced girl and the invisible being were married. They lived together in great gladness and were never parted. Okay, my friends, so that is your first story, The Rough-Faced Girl. So if we come back to this page of our presentation, we can talk a little bit about the heroine or her hero who is kind yet mistreated. So by now, you probably know that we are talking about The Rough-Faced Girl. She was made to tend the fires. Tend means to look after the fires. Because remember, that's a time back when we didn't have a stove that you could go over to and just turn on when you wanted to cook things. So you always kept a fire burning so that you'd have it when you, when you needed it. So tending to the fire meant she was always adding wood to the fire. So as sparks came out of the fire, they landed on her arms and on her face. And over time, they became very scarred and rough looking. So that's where she got the nickname from her very unkind and cruel sisters. So what's the magical element in this character? That's right, the magical being, the warrior or the invisible being that was wealthy, that lived in the wigwam, the biggest wigwam in the village with the beautiful pictures on the side. And so she falls in love with this magical being and he falls in love with her and he's very wealthy. And there's that happy ending where she goes to the, um, the lake and washes to put on the new beautiful garments and garments is just a fancy word for clothing. And as she's in the lake washing, all of those scars and all that roughness of her skin just washes away and then she has her prince or her magical being, and they go off and they live happily ever after. So this is an Iroquois Indian version of the rough-faced girl. 
is a Cinderella, it's a legend or a story that is connected to or part of what we call Cinderella stories from around the world. So this is a Cinderella version called The Rough Face Girl. Again, if you need to listen to it another time, you can rewind this presentation or you can go on YouTube and look up Rough Face Girl and you'll see lots of different versions of it. Hopefully you enjoyed this story and we're gonna to go to the next page just to remind you that this is what you're doing for today. This is Monday. You're going to compare and contrast the rough faced girl with their traditional Cinderella story. You, wow, and you already know there's gonna be some things that are different. Is there a magic slipper or a moccasin or a boot? Nope, there's no magic. Um, element that identifies the Cinderella. How did how is this Cinderella then identified as being the correct character? Well, the mean and cruel sisters couldn't pass the test, could they? They were asked questions by the invisible being sister and they didn't know them. But this Cinderella or this rough faced girl did because of her kind and giving and generous heart. So you're gonna see some of those differences. Remember there is a very present father um, there is no stepmother. Okay, so think about some of those elements that we that you've compared and contrasted in your previous stories. Now, as we go to this next screen, this is a place for you to pause, and you're going to come back here for tomorrow's story, which is Mufaro's beautiful daughter. All right, so we're going to pause. Okay, boys and girls, today, this is Tuesday, and we're going to read another Cinderella story from around the world. This is an African-American tale, and it's called Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters. And you can see right underneath the title, it says, An African Tale. All right, so just like yesterday when we read The Rough Race Girl, there are going to, there's going to be some things that are not present. Remember, instead of the six different characteristics that are common among a Cinderella story, we've broken down just these four because there's not going to be a uh, magical slipper that identifies Cinderella. Um, the Cinderella character is going to be identified by something different. Now in the rough faced girl from yesterday, she was identified by being able to answer specific questions by the invisible being's sister. So today, how will the Cinderella character be identified? There is some type of prince or princess or a wealthy person that will fall in love with the Cinderella character. We will have a kind-hearted heroine, and then we will have sister, a sister, one sister who's cruel and um, mistreats the Cinderella character. So this is Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters, and I really think that you're going to enjoy this story. It's an African tale of a Cinderella story from around the world. Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters, an African tale by John Steptoe. A long time ago in a certain place in Africa, a small village lay across a river and a half a day's journey from a city where a great king lived. A man named Mufaro lived in this village with his two daughters, who were called Manyara and Nyasha. Everyone agreed that Manyara and Nyasha were very beautiful. Manyara was almost always in a bad temper, she teased her sister whenever their father's back was turned, and she had been heard to say, Someday, Nyasha, I will be a queen, and you will be a servant in my household. If that should come to pass, Nyasha responded, I will be pleased to serve you. But why do you say such things? You are clever and strong and beautiful. Why are you so unhappy? Because everyone talks about how kind you are, and they praise everything you do, Nyasha replied. I'm certain that father loves you best, but when I am queen, everyone will know that your silly kindness is only weakness. Nyasha was sad that Manyara felt this way, but she ignored her sister's words and went about her chores. Nyasha kept a small plot of land on which she grew millets, sunflowers, yams, and vegetables. She always sang as she worked, and some said it was her singing that made her crops more bountiful than anyone else's. One day, Nyasha noticed a small garden snake resting beneath a yam vine. Good day, little Nyoka, she called to him. You are welcome here. You will keep away any creatures who might spoil my vegetables. She bent forward and gave the little snake a loving pat on the head and then returned to her work. From that day on, Nyoka was always at Nyasha's side when she tended her garden. 
It was said that she sang all the more sweetly when he was there. Mufaro knew nothing of how Manyara treated Nyasha. Nyasha was too considerate of her father's feelings to complain, and Manyara was always careful to behave herself when Mufaro was around. Early one morning, a messenger from the city arrived. The great king wanted a wife. The most worthy and beautiful daughters in the land are invited to appear before the king, and he will choose one to become queen. The messenger proclaimed. Mufaro called Manyara and Nyasha to him. It would be a great honor to have one of you chosen, he said. Prepare yourself to journey to the city. I will call together our friends to make a wedding party. We will leave tomorrow as the sun rises. But my father, Manyara said sweetly, it would be painful for either of us to leave you. Even to be a wife to the king, I know Nyasha would grieve to death if she were parted from you. I am strong. Send me to the city and let poor Nyasha be happy here with you. Mufaro beamed with pride. The king has asked for the most worthy and the most beautiful. No, Manyara, I cannot send you alone. Only a king can choose between two such worthy daughters. Both of you must go. That night, when everyone was asleep, Manyara stole quietly out of the village. She had never been in the forest at night before and she was frightened. But her greed to be the first to appear before the king drove her on. In her hurry, she almost stumbled over a small boy who suddenly appeared standing in the path. Please, said the boy, I am hungry. Will you give me something to eat? I have brought only enough for myself, Manyara replied. But please, said the boy, I am so very hungry. Out of my way, boy. Tomorrow I will become your queen. How dare you stand in my path? After traveling for what seemed to be a great distance, Manyara came to a small clearing. There, silhouetted against the moonlight, was an old woman seated on a large stone. The old woman spoke. I will give you some advice, Manyara. Soon after you pass the place where the two paths cross, you will see a grove of trees. They will laugh at you. You must not laugh in return. Later, you will meet a man with his head under his arm. You must be polite to him. How do you know my name? How dare you advise your future queen? Stand beside you ugly old women, Manyara scolded, and then rushed on her way without looking back. Just as the woman had foretold, Manyara came to a grove of trees, and they did indeed seem to be laughing at her. I must be calm. Manyara thought, I will not be frightened. She looked up at the trees and laughed out loud. I laugh at you, trees, she shouted, and she hurried on. It was not yet dawn when Manyara heard the sounds of rushing water. The river must be up ahead, she thought. The great city is just on the other side. But there, on the rise, she saw a man with his head tucked under his arm. Manyara ran past him without speaking. A queen acknowledges only those who please her, she said to herself. I will be queen, I will be queen, she chanted as she hurried on towards the city. Nyasha woke at the first light of dawn. As she put on her finest garments, she thought of how her life might be changed forever beyond this day. I'd much prefer to live here, she admitted to herself. I'd hate to leave this village and never see my father or sing to little Nyoka again. Her thoughts were interrupted by loud shouts and a commotion from the wedding party assembled outside. Manyara was missing. Everyone bustled about searching and calling for her. When they found her footprints on the path that led to the city, they decided to go on as planned. As the wedding party moved through the forest, brightly plumed birds darted about in the cool green shadows beneath the trees. Though anxious about her sister, Nyasha was soon filled with excitement about all there was to see. They were deep in the forest when she saw the small boy standing by the side of the path. You must be hungry, she said, and handed him a yam she had brought for her lunch. The boy smiled and disappeared as quietly as he had come. Later, as they were approaching the place where two paths crossed, the old woman appeared and silently pointed the way to the city. Nyasha thanked her and gave her a small pouch filled with sunflower seeds. 
The sun was high in the sky when the party came to the grove of towering trees. Their uppermost branches seemed to bow down to Nyasha as she passed beneath them. At last, someone announced that they were near the destination. Nyasha ran ahead and topped the rise before the others could catch up with her. She stood transfixed at her first sight of the city. Oh, my father, she called. A great spirit must stand guard here. Just look at what lies before us. I never in all of my life dreamed there could be anything so beautiful. Arm in arm, Nyasha and her father descended the hill, crossed the river, and approached the city gate. Just as they entered through the great doors, the air was rent by piercing cries, and Manyara ran wildly out of a chamber at the center of the enclosure. When she saw Nyasha, she fell upon her, sobbing. Do not go to the king, my sister. Oh, please, do not let her go, she cried hysterically. There's a great monster there, a snake with five heads. He said that he knew all my faults and that I displeased him. He would have swallowed me alive if I had not run. Oh, my sister, please do not go inside that place. It frightened Nyasha to see her sister so upset. But leaving her father to comfort Manyara, she bravely made her way to the chamber and opened the door. On the seat of the great chief's stool lay the little garden snake. Nyasha laughed with relief and joy. My little friend, she exclaimed, it's such a pleasure to see you, but why are you here? I am the king, Nyoka replied. And there before Nyasha's eyes, the garden snake changed shape. I am the king. I am also the hungry boy with whom you shared a yam in the forest, and the old woman to whom you made a gift of some flower seeds. But you know me best as Nioka. Because I have been all of these, I know you to be the most worthy and most beautiful daughter in the land. It would make me very happy if you would be my wife. And so it was that. A long time ago, Nyasha agreed to be married. The king's mother and sisters took Nyasha to their house and the wedding preparations began. The best weavers in the land laid out their finest cloth for her wedding garments. Villagers from all around were invited to the celebration and a great feast was held. Nyasha prepared the bread for the wedding feast from millet that had been brought from her village. Mufaro proclaimed to all who would hear him that he was the happiest father in all the land, for he was blessed with two beautiful and worthy daughters, Nyasha, the queen, and Manyara, a servant in the queen's household. So there you have it, the story of Mufaro's beautiful daughters. So you can, you can see from this particular version of the Cinderella story that we had two sisters, one with a very cruel heart and Naish Nasha with a very kind and beautiful heart. So there's one sister who thinks she's better than the other. And when I become queen, you will be a servant in my palace. And um, it's a wonderful story. And I think you, I hope that you notice from both of the stories that it certainly is a focus on kindness and treating others with kindness and courtesy and respect. So what was the magical element in this particular story? That's right. It was the king or the the who could transform into the snake and into the uh, old woman and into the young boy who was really watching these two sisters from afar and seeing who really was the kind, uh, kind hearted uh, person. So the prince had fallen or the king had fallen in love with her long before she even came to the city. I hope you enjoyed both of these stories. And just like the uh, rough faced girl with this particular story, we're going to look at today comparing and contrasting this Mufaro's beautiful daughters with the Cinderella, the classic Cinderella story. So this is Tuesday.
and this is your assignment for today. And again, remember, you can listen to the stories again. You can rewind it and listen to it again, because right, I know that you're not seeing the words, um, and then you can uh, do the assignment then, or if you go on YouTube and type in Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters, there'll be other stories that you can listen to that are being read aloud by, by different people. But both stories are, again, fall into the category of Cinderella stories from around the world, but they're just a little bit different because they don't have all the magical elements that we're used to seeing and reading about as we read the stories last week. So now you have it, you have today's assignment. And again, remember you can go back and you can pause, you can listen to it again, but you're gonna be focusing on these four elements or these four um, common pieces of a Cinderella story. So there you have it. I can't wait to see your Venn diagram. Uh, for both of the stories. And remember, you should have them turned in no later than Tuesday night because you'll have a new assignment on Wednesday. Bye for now.